Welcome back motorized bike enthusiasts, this is part 2 in our performance and port work series. If you haven't seen part 1, link in the description, as well as a roadmap to future episodes that you can expect to see. This episode will also double as our official review of the Firestorm Zeta 80. The results won't surprise you if you've been watching the channel for long enough, but some new viewers might appreciate that. Our ultimate goal with this series is to basically learn as much as we can about these little motorized bike kits and get the most performance we can out of them for any given situation while documenting our results along the way because showing is better than telling. In today's episode, we got a head-to-head -head test between the stock pipe and the MZ65 clone, and the results might be pretty eye-opening and not exactly what you expect. We also have a wealth of information in this episode that I think you guys might really appreciate, so stay tuned. We spent the past week breaking in the motor so we could get some solid results, so let's get straight into a head-to-head -head test. Okay, we got three pulls for you guys. I'm going to narrate this first one because there's going to be a bit of information on the screen and I just want to make sure you guys know what's going on. The top is the MZ65 clone and the bottom is the stock pipe. I had to boost the brightness so you could see the GPS because we had shadow, so apologies for any quality loss on the top one. So starting at 15.5 miles an hour simply because that's exactly 3,000 RPMs on the tachometer. And since the tachometer refreshes faster than the GPS, it was easier to use the tach to start the pools for more consistent results. Now over on the left, I'm also going to add a smaller 15 to 25 mile an hour pool result. And this will be more important later on. In both results, you're going to see a night and day difference. However, the 15 to 25 is more consistent simply because if there is any slight uphill gradient, the stock pipe really struggles versus the MZ65 clone. Here are our results for the first pull. The MZ65 hit 30 miles an hour at 12.3 seconds and it hit 25 at 7.29 seconds. It actually hit 30 miles an hour right around the same time the stock pipe was hitting 25 which means in that 15 to 30 mile an hour range, the MZ65 clone accelerates almost twice as fast as the stock pipe. This was a great test that shows us a lot. There's a night and day difference in performance you can see, especially in acceleration in the sweet spot range of the motor being between 4200 RPM and 6000. However, there's not a big difference in top speed. Now you can clearly see that the MZ65 clone accelerates to 30 miles an hour, getting close to its top speed of 35 miles an hour in about half the time as the stock pipe, but their actual top speed was 33 for the stock pipe and 35 for the MZ65 clone. Now at a glance, someone might say it's only a two mile an hour improvement, so not worth the price, but they're completely missing out on the acceleration terms because had this been a short duration race, the MZ65 clone would have reached the finish line well before the stock pipe. Which is why when people make claims of top speed, it's to be taken with a grain of salt. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to discredit anyone who has a fast bike. I'm just trying to say that if your question is always how fast does it go, you're missing out on everything else. We'll touch more on the mechanical workings of these pipes and how they affect motors in more advanced episodes as the series progresses. As I still have a lot to learn, but mark my words, I will learn it. And so will you. For now, I'm left wondering if this pipe is actually doing what it's intended to do, or if the design is too poor and it's simply providing a less restrictive exhaust, which is where we're getting our performance from. 
You see, the pipe is designed to reflect pressure waves, improving efficiency and performance. But I don't really know if it's doing that. There are a lot of calculations that go into designing these pipes to get them to actually do what they're intended to do. For now, this is what we have, so we'll push on. And it is an improvement, so we can take that for what it's worth. I do plan on testing it up against the BikeBerry Deluxe version, per request from viewers, which appears to be the same as the WC80 we have on the Swin Taff. We'll find out. Eventually, we'll have a welder, so we'll be able to mock up an MZ65 pipe, as been requested on this channel since its beginning, and if we're lucky, we'll even design our own. But that's going to be in very advanced episodes as the series has a long way to go, so we'll treat it as a marathon, not a race. Now that we have our base numbers out of the way, let's better understand why these motors are designed in a way that offers very limited, or more appropriately said, very specific stock performance for their size. And stick with me here, because I promise by the time we're done, you'll not only have a good understanding of what we're working with, but you may even become thankful of what they were able to accomplish. Given the multitude of limitations the designers and engineers had to work with, it's in my opinion that they knew exactly what they were doing, executed it well, and don't get the credit they deserve. Excluding manufacturing defects, which is, for the most part, out of the designer's control. The main limitations they had to work around are as follows. It needed to be universal, allowing fitment to as many common frames as possible with as few modifications as possible. It needed to be cheap and easy to make so it could appeal to its intended market. Price, along with the previously mentioned low modification requirement, means no pull start, no transmission. It needed to serve a real world purpose in order to justify bulk manufacturing. It needed to be cheap and easy to repair to boost its appeal to the average bike rider. Finally, it needed to be reliable and practical. And again, reliability mainly comes down to the quality of the manufacturer. As many of us who have received a decent kit know, they can last for years. So great, but where does performance fit into all this? Well, it doesn't. Not really anyways. You see, these kits are more relatable to DIY tractors than they are to actual motorcycles. Only intended to get the job done, with top speed not only being the least prioritized element of their design, but as you will see in a moment, purposefully ignored. This is only the surface level explanation as to why these motors may seem underpowered. Many builders know, and you will too soon in the series, that something as simple as a remap port design could offer considerably more power. Just knowing that a high-end scooter motor with the same or even less displacement will almost always outperform a motorized bike kit may have you asking, why didn't they just cast a more aggressive port map for these kits? Surely something as simple as changing the cylinder mold would be a small price to pay for a motor that offers more power, right? After all, it's not like they would be using more material or labor, and more power almost always appeals to the consumer. This is where it all falls down to price. The designers knew these motors were going to be made quickly and with low quality parts. Thin cast aluminum bodies, relatively soft bearings, subpar cylinder linings, thin chains and sprockets, no forced air cooling, and would be subject to poor riding conditions just to name a few. Not to mention most of these would be going on equally low quality bicycles. They knew full well that offering a high revving, high torque motor within these conditions would only leave them with a lot more broken motors than we already see. A good example of this is the first generation Phantom 85. It has a more aggressive port map and considerably wider piston that offers a night and day difference in raw power, but requires the use of more expensive ceramic cylinder lining, thicker supports for the crankcase bearing, a reed valve to take advantage of its port map, a higher quality exhaust, and the price reflects it. Sadly, these measures were not enough to stop a nearly 100% failure rate due to an overlooked Conrod bushing, which also needed to be upgraded. One way these engine designers are able to improve upon performance while staying within an acceptable failure rate is to increase displacement while maintaining relatively low RPMs. You see this done on the YD100. It uses a nearly identical port map to that of your typical PK80. This offers more stock torque due to its larger piston, but maintains a similar top speed and RPM limit due to its port map. And remember that because it may help later on as we start cutting. Although the cases on the YD100 are built slightly stronger, they're still able to use the same subpar components. 
In a nutshell, this all boils down to an RPM limitation. High revving motors need to be built with more expensive parts in order to survive. There are other reasons as well, such as the fact that high revving small displacement two strokes need a transmission to be practical because they sacrifice low RPM power to make high RPM power, which we'll touch on in more detail as we progress. This would make for a lot more pedaling before the engine would be able to bite. And in short trip stop and go conditions where these kits shine, this is just not practical. Now that you know what these motors are and why, you should have a strong understanding that the more power we pull out of these motors, the closer we bring them to their already low limits. I know this is probably a lot of information to try and take in at once, but you should have a little time to reflect on it as I'm cutting into the cylinder for our next episode, which will hopefully be out by Sunday. I'll try not to make you guys wait an entire week for it. Nearly every modification we make to these motors throughout the series will have a sacrifice somewhere to gain something else. And the pipe is no exception, however it is by far the fastest and easiest way to increase performance without many sacrifices. It costs some money, yes, and is loud if you don't add a silencer, but with the silencer we added, we not only gained performance with the pipe, but were able to keep it just as quiet as it was with the stock exhaust which does require some tuning with the carburetor, but we'll get more into that later. The pipe does add a bit more stress to the motor. You have a slightly higher top speed and more torque, so more acceleration. This will decrease longevity of the motor, but in terms of what we'll be doing throughout the series, it's by far the lowest impact I can see on longevity, and I don't think it would hurt to put a pipe on pretty much any kit. The amount of performance you'll gain greatly outweighs any slight loss in reliability. As for the Firestorm Zeta 80 and our official review, well, if you've been following the channel for long enough, you know that we've kind of been unofficially reviewing this motor for years. We've been abusing it, torturing it, and sending it through conditions that most normal motorized bikes would never see. Link in the description to our last video if you want to see a little taste of what has gone through over the past three years. This new Firestorm is no exception. Upon arrival and initial inspection, the cleanliness and build quality of our newest Firestorm appears to be a bit better than it was with our original kit we got years ago, so that's a bonus. We did have to address a few issues, adding a little bit of grease to the bevel gears and the clutch cam, which seems to be common throughout motorized bike kits, but all in all I couldn't see any major issues with this motor. They even installed the crankcase seals properly this time, which has been a big headache throughout motorized bike kits for a long time. During the unboxing in our last episode, you'll note that we only had two minor complaints. The defective trigger lock clutch lever, which I wish they would either fix or move away from, and the slant on the chain tensioner still moving towards the engine instead of the sprocket. Those are the only two updates I would recommend for this kit, but those are small gripes in the grand scheme of things, which is why this stays in my number one top motor for new and experienced builders. As you can see from our previous test, the stock motor has no issues reaching just above 30 miles an hour. That's with the 36 tooth sprocket on 26 inch wheels. I would recommend staying with the 44 tooth for stop and go traffic or city travel. Your top speed would drop a bit lower, but in stop and go conditions or if you have to deal with any hills, you'll be thankful you stuck with the larger sprocket. For me however, I have mostly flat roads to deal with, so the 36 is perfect. For our next few stops on the roadmap, look forward to our next episode, which should have some basic port work and give some relatively safe numbers which most of you will be able to use without many negative effects. We'll also be testing some carburetors, getting a well-tuned bike before moving on to some more advanced port work, which will really open up this little motor. And until next time guys, ride safe.